Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Good morning, family. How you doing? We've had a great service so far. I'm really excited about being able to continue this sermon series, Powerful Prayers, this morning. Now, Pastor John Mark started off the series a couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, and his sermon was about, his sermon was about how our vision is changed in prayer. Remember he had the water vase up here and the arrow changed directions? Then P. Mike followed that up by talking to us and showing us how to pray. Now, if you didn't grab a prayer card uh, when we had them that weekend, we have some more printed and available for you in the Welcome Center. We want you to take those cards with you. We also posted it on social media because we understand some people lose things, right? So we have that prayer card available to you. And then last week, Pastor Josh talked about our heritage that we have in faith, in prayer, and being able to pray powerful prayer and ask audacious things because of who we are in Christ. Now, because I've wrapped up everyone else's sermon, I don't have to preach today, right? <laughs> no, but seriously, I love that I get to serve alongside such amazing pastors here at Family Church. We have an amazing team here, church. I hope you know that. So, now, today I get the opportunity and the privilege to pray and to preach about one of my most favorite writers and one of my most favorite prayers. Now, this writer is a worshiper, so I know I'm a bit biased. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about David. Yeah. David was anointed to be king while he was still a shepherd boy. David had struggles. But he was a man after God's own heart. Let's read this verse that we'll focus on a little bit later on. It's Psalm 23 and 4. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we ask you to be who we need you to be in and through our lives, but specifically for this moment, would you open the eyes of our understanding? Help us to see you and to hear you and help us to apply what is taught. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, family, I have three siblings. I have two sisters and I have one brother. But growing up, I only had me and my little brother in a household. And let me tell you, me and my little brother, we fought. You hear me? We fought consistently. We loved each other, but we fought. Um, my little brother is seven years younger than me, but he was born bigger than me. <laughs> so what he thought that meant was that he could take me. <laughs> but I used to tell him, look, try Jesus, don't try me. <laughs> But he never listened. And so we would fight and fight and fight. But my little brother got smart. One day he decided, you know what? I'm going to act crazy in public. You know, as they say it in the South, I'm going to take the fight to the streets. <laughs> we were sitting in church. And um, well, first off, let me say, so we, we were sitting in church. Our, our youth, or our children rather, sat in church. For those watching online, we have a wonderful facility here that facilitates our children and our youth that is next door. I mean, we have amazing leaders. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Shauna and Ms. Ceci are doing an amazing job. So if you're watching online and you're trying to figure out if there's a space for you and your entire family, there is, I'm telling you. So back to my story. We didn't have that. <laughs> we had the left side of the church. And you had better act like you had some sense. <laughs> now... Every week, my mom uh, ushered, she served every weekend, which meant that I was in charge. I was the oldest. It was my job to make sure my little brother sat there and act like he was supposed to act. But, of course, he didn't. Um, one day in particular, my 
little brother decided to start to pew jump. Literally, we had pews, and he would just climb from pew to pew, climbing over people, making all kind of noise in the middle of service. <laughs> and so I'm like, bro, come here. Hey, stop that. Chill out. Like, and he's not having it. So what did I do? You know, I start trying to sneak around the pew so I won't be seen. And I took him and I jerk him down. Bro, I don't know what got into my little brother, but oh boy, he swung his arm all the way back and pop. He smacked the fire out of me. You hear me? <laughs> Let me tell you, he slapped me tasteless. I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> the whole world like paused for like 10 seconds. I don't know if y'all saw, I don't know if I should bring this up, but I don't know if you saw uh, Will Smith slapping Chris Rock and how Chris <laughs> And how Chris Rock kind of paused for a moment. That's what happened to me. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> Let me tell you. That entire section erupted in laughter, much like what you just did. Now, I'm a little confused why you all find pleasure in my pain. But <laughs> we have CR for that, Thursday the 7th. <laughs> no, but seriously, I was hurting physically but internally. My pride was a little hurt. I was confused because I couldn't figure out why he would do that. I was stressed because what do you do after that? <laughs> and of course, I was embarrassed. I wonder if there's anyone else in this room that has felt that way before. Hurt, embarrassed, confused, stressed out. I've had all of these feelings multiple times throughout my life. And I believe that's the way that David felt when he wrote Psalm 23. David was dealing with some heavy burdens when he wrote this prayer. And I get it, you're probably a little confused now because wasn't David a shepherd boy when he wrote this? Wasn't he out in the field when he prayed this prayer? Well, that is actually an inaccurate analysis of the time period in which he wrote this. There's significant evidence that indicates that David wrote Psalm 23 not while he was a shepherd boy, but rather while his son Absalom was plotting to kill him. His son was trying to murder him. David was probably around the ages or between the ages of 67 and 70 when he would pray Psalm 23. Not a young shepherd boy. And it would be three years before Absalom would ultimately be killed. I just got slapped. <laughs> but David, David was really in the valley of the shadow of death. Understand this, for those who don't know a lot about David. David had already defeated a lion. He had already defeated a bear. I don't know if you heard about the shepherd boy that killed the giant. That was David. He conquered Jerusalem and he united all of Israel. He conquered so many territories. And he even conquered the matters of his heart. But with all those achievements, with all those accolades, we find David here in Psalm 23, and he's burdened. But in spite of David's heavy burden, he has a clarity of mind because of his relationship with God. God was his shepherd. God was his guide. God was his leader, his provider, and his protector. Why? Did he believe this? Well, because God was with him when he defeated the lion. And God was with him when he defeated the bear. And God was right alongside him when he defeated Goliath and conquered all of those territories. And God was with him every step of the way in his walk with becoming more in tune with who God was. I have a question for you today, and it's rhetorical, and I'll ask it a couple of times today. Are you confident in your relationship with God today? We are going to read Psalm 
23 in its entirety, but we will stop along the way and we will break down different sections, okay? So let's start at the beginning. Psalm 23, starting at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Now, reading this passage, knowing the context seems a little odd, right? Because why would David start off this prayer while his own son is plotting to kill him? I believe David wasn't just speaking. I believe David is saying this is what God has done before. He's already been my shepherd. He's proven to be that in my life, so I'm not going to want. He's already led me beside the still waters. So this situation can't take me out. David's assurance of who God was wasn't dependent on his circumstances, but rather it was dependent on his relationship with God. I wonder today what we're dependent on in this room. Some of us go to school, and we should, to get more education, but then we start to depend on our education and what we've accomplished, as opposed to looking to the author and the finisher of our faith. Sometimes we look to government, and we look to politics, and we look to the stock market, and job security, and all these other things so that we can be assured that we're all right, but all of those things will fail you. But God never will. I am sure David was troubled, but he also had the faith in the one who had delivered him before. (laughs) God had a track record of being faithful in his life. So... When we read Psalm 1, 23, 1 through 3, I don't believe that David is reminding God of who he is in this prayer. I believe David is reminding himself. I might be in the valley of the shadow, the valley of death, David is saying, but I remember who God is. David proceeds to say that in the midst of chaos, he is able to live in peace. The truth in this verse is that when we walk with God hand in hand, no matter the circumstances and no matter the situation, there is peace that is afforded and available for each and every one of us. David keeps speaking and he says, he renews my life in the valley. Some version says he renews my soul. The line here, he renews or he restores my soul, is translated as shob nefesh. Everybody say shob nefesh. Good job. What this means is to turn the entirety of who you are around. Not just your life, not just your career, everything. Shob Nefesh. So what David is acknowledging that when in the valley there is potential to stray, but God is a God who will help you to redirect. Yeah, everything, our very being. And he is sure and he's confident in this. Again, I ask, are you confident in your relationship with God? Are you confident in who he is? Verse 4, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. (laughs) That's easy to say, David. Not always easy to live. I just wonder if David was trying to convince himself What if David wasn't sure himself? 
What if David is confessing what the goal should be? We don't know, to be quite honest, but I believe that David ultimately wants us all to know and what he was writing and what he was convincing himself is that God is God no matter what I face. And even when I go through the darkest of valleys, I fear no danger. When I was reading this entire passage, verse 4 is a verse that stuck out to me the most. But within verse 4, there were two words that tripped me up. (laughs) And it's the first two words. Even when. Now before we break that down, for those who have a physical Bible or for those who are on their phones, I want you to take a note of this. I want you to underline even when. And then I want you to underline through. Underline darkest valley. I fear no danger. For you are with me. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If we're honest today, family, typically we don't prepare for the even when scenarios. We prepare for the if when, but not the even when. An even when scenario is like creating a will. Well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to (laughs) die. Right? An even win scenario is saving for a new car. You know your car is going to fall apart eventually. It's a 1993 Toyota Camaro. (laughs) I'll tell you, Toyota Camaro, Toyota Corolla. (laughs) With 400,000 miles on it. It's going to break down. (laughs) Save some money. (laughs) But we typically don't save for those scenarios. The even win scenarios. Oftentimes, I believe we do that because we're afraid of when those moments come. Maybe we're not sure if God will be there with us when we find ourselves in that dark valley. Or maybe we think, you know, that could never happen to me, right? The worst situation that could never happen to me. And even if no weapon formed against me shall ever prosper, right? That scripture is true to its core. You hear me? But in order to see that the weapon won't prosper, it has to form. Y'all know me. I bring truth and reality. The truth and the reality, even when you walk with God, is that some days will be tough. Sometimes you'll sit in a crowded room and feel like you're alone. There's some people in this room that feel like that today. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will show you that he is comfort and that you're not alone. Sometimes your kids are going to act crazy. (laughs) You know, I'm going to just stop right there. (laughs) Sometimes your coworkers might say a passive-aggressive comment and it makes you question your salvation. It's like, you don't know me like that, I'll punch you in the face in Jesus' name. (laughs) Sometimes there might be a bad report from the doctor that leaves and renders you hopeless. And there's even a possibility of you slipping back into addiction. What then? What do we do even then? David's darkest valley was his son trying to kill him. But our darkest valley could be anything. My question today is what are you going to do when you find yourself even when you're there in that darkest valley? Let's read. That verse again, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, the first thing that I really want you to understand and to hear about this verse is that the valley is not a resting place. Do you hear me? The valley is not a resting place. It's not a place that we pitch a tent and we stay and we camp. We go through the valley. Oftentimes, the enemy convinces us and he distracts us and we stay for longer than God intended. The way he distracts us is he piles one thing on top of another. It's never just one thing. It can't just be my car broke down. <laughs> but my car broke down, my kids acting crazy, you know, all these random bills coming. Like, it's everything. Now look at me. In this valley. But understand that negative situations without God are bad. But negative situations with God oftentimes can have peace, can have joy. I know that's odd to say. David is saying, you know, I fear no danger because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Both the rod and the staff, they were both used to protect the sheep. The rod specifically was used to beat off the enemy, the wolves or whatever would come and try to attack the sheep. And the staff was used to, you know, guide the sheep out of situations that they might find themselves in that they couldn't get themselves out of. Now, in this passage, David is comparing the shepherd to God and us to the sheep. And I get it. You say, you know, I ain't no sheep. I ain't sheeple. I'm not dumb. That's not really what sheep are. Sheep aren't necessarily dumb. They're dependent. They're dependent on their shepherd. And that's what David is saying in this verse. He is saying that even when I go through my worst nightmare, I know that you got me. <laughs> Do you believe that today, family? I dare you to look to your neighbor and just say, hey, he got me. Yeah, yeah. Now, now look to your second choice and say, he got me. <laughs> yeah. Your situation. <laughs> I love it. Your situation might look bleak. But God is with you. God's faithfulness is proven in those even when scenarios in your life. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Understand this, family, that all of hell is jealous because of the favor that you have on your life. God is with you. Now, I believe that God has favorites, but I believe that we all have favor. Which means that God is with us on our mountaintop experience. And he's also with us in the valley. And, it, and the adversary would want you to think that because you're distracted, because things are happening that God isn't with you, but understand that he is and ultimately there's nothing that the enemy can do. You are being pursued by the creator of the universe. How amazing is that, that the one who calls the world to be walks with you and talks with you and you can have a relationship with him and you can talk to him and listen, he answers. How amazing is that? He wants nothing but for you to live in abundance. But sometimes the reality is 
we find ourselves in the valley. But that's not where we're going to stay. The reason that I chose David today is because David had a relationship that, in my opinion, is the epitome of what we should be striving after. David was a normal person. Like, he, he had his shortcomings, his shortfall. We know it. Every sermon about David is about what he did and what, how he doesn't measure up and blah, 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 blah. We get it. Me too. <laughs> but David sought God. In spite of his tendencies and in spite of who he was, he sought after God so much so that God called him a man after his own heart. Back in Samuel. So I thought it fitting to talk about David because the highest form of prayer is worship. Saying, God, I give you the entirety of who I am, my everything, not just a song, my life. And I lay it down as a sacrifice, which is my reasonable act of service. It's the bare minimum. All of these psalms that we read that people are still reciting and singing, (laughs) this is just David talking to God. It's just him praying. See, but before we get to prayer changing our vision, and before we go to God with power because of our heritage of faith, and before we have the template of how to pray, we must first remember who God is. You know, oftentimes we don't go to God in prayer. Why? Because where is he right now when the storms are raging? Why would he allow me to get here? I don't understand how I got here. But when you get there, even when that happens, remember who God is. Psalm 77, 11 through 12 says, I will remember the Lord's work. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. Listen, stop looking at every situation through the lens of negativity. You hear me? Look through the lens of faith. Start confessing the truth of who God is in every situation The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's provision. Even he he makes me or he allows me to lay down in green pastures and he restores my soul. That's rest. Understand that when you find yourself in your worst nightmare in the valley, in those even when scenarios, there is rest, there is joy, and there is peace. Don't focus on the negative of your situation. Second point, recognize who is with you. (laughs) Matthew 28 and 20 says, And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You're not by yourself. It might feel like you're alone, but that as well is a trick of the enemy. (laughs) God is with you. Third thing I want you to take hold of is to receive. That's simple. Mark 11 and 24 reads, Therefore I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received and it will be yours. Stop praying and not having the faith to believe that he can and he will. The promises of God are yes and amen. Listen, oftentimes we don't go to God and we don't need God until all hell breaks loose. 
But today, I am challenging you to make a decision that when you find yourself in those even win scenarios, that your first response will be to pray. Start that prayer by recalling who God is. God, you've healed me before. And if you haven't healed me before, I've seen you do it. So if I've seen you do it, I know you can do it again because you're the same God you were yesterday, you're the same God today, and you'll be that same God forevermore. I know you can. Maybe it feels as if all hell has broken loose, and that might be the reality for you. God, I know you to be a, a God who can calm the raging storms. Calm the storm and bring me peace. Don't stop in the valley. Don't stay there. Remember who he is. Recognize he is with you and receive the promises of God. These assurances that I am telling you about, they all come as a result of having a relationship with God. Today, you might be in this room and you say, you know what, I don't feel the same way you feel. I don't have that same assurance as David. It's hard to confess that. If you are not a believer first. Here at Family Church, we believe in Romans 10 and 9 that says, if you Believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. This is the first step in stepping into having that relationship with God. And in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer and help you to make that next step in your walk in your relationship with God. If you are a believer and you find yourself in a dark place in that valley... Directly after the service, we'll have care team members down here. I'm going to walk down, and I want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you find the answer that you are looking for and help usher you and help lead you out of that valley. Let's pray this prayer of salvation today. Everyone, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.